Okay. And if you've been here for the last several weeks, we've been talking about this concept of sacrifice. And uh, it's not something we should forget about. So Devon's going to wrap up this series, I believe, today. But let's prepare our hearts by receiving the worship team and a special song. So take it away, worship team. Next voice you hear will be Pastor Devon. One. Have your way. Have your way. Sometimes I realize that sometimes it's, it's harder to really accept that when you talk about God. And I realize that in this song you're going to hear, we were created for God's glory, yeah. his purpose, and his what? His pleasure. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. I was created for your glory. I was created for your purpose. I was created for your pleasure. Have your way. I was created for your glory. I was created for your purpose. I was created for your pleasure. Have your way.
your feet. Talk to your Jesus this morning. personal. One more time, but God is doing something. Here I am. You sing it. Arms out stretch. Empty cup. Fill it up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to do it from, from, from your spirit of love. I want you to pray for the hand that you're holding from the spirit of love. Go ahead and do that now. Begin to pray. Begin to pray that God would shed the weight of this week and allow them now to receive the word. Hallelujah. In the purity and innocence of having no stress, no worries. Right now, we're asking for the peace that surpasses all understanding. Begin to pray now. Begin to pray now. Hallelujah. Every head bow, every eyes closed, we're praying, we're praying, we're praying. We're praying, we're praying, hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. The fervent, effectual prayers of the righteous. Availeth much, hallelujah. Come on, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Hallelujah. God's presence is moving through your prayers even now. Hallelujah, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Husbands, pray over your spouses now. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. You have no idea how much hell it took for some of these people to get here. The hand you're holding may be on the brink of depression, the brink of suicide. And your prayer could break them free. Come on. Worship is good, but sometimes your prayer is the tipping point for the person that you're next to. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And God, we magnify your name this morning. For truly, God, you are great beyond our comprehension or beyond our vocabulary. Good isn't good enough to describe how great you really are. And so this morning, we want to celebrate the fact that you're indescribable. We want to celebrate the fact, God, that you're stronger than our own plans, that you're able to handle things, God, beyond our own understanding of how you handled them. We thank you, God, that you have already set up victory for us on the other side. Help us, God, this morning. Not, God, just to see the result, but to trust you until we do. I'm praying, God, that today for all households, all minds, God, that have been plagued with the weight of the what if.
God, we end the, we end the question and we put a period on the sentence to say, God, you can. We forget about what could happen and we celebrate what's already been done, God. You have called us more than conquerors, God. You have called us the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, God. These are promises that you gave to us thousands of years ago. We celebrate, God, because you knew we were coming and you knew we would mess up, God, but you already had a solution to the problem. My God. I thank you, God, that even in the midst of our emotional wreckage, that you're coming to set order in our hearts once again. I pray, God, that you would clean away, God, the parts of us, God, that are bitter. God, clear out the scar tissue of our emotions. Allow us to be free to love you once again. We pray, God, that you would allow our minds to be fertile ground for your word. But above all, God, we're asking that you would give us the strength to be doers of your word and not just hearers. God, I lift myself up today because... There is no possible way I can speak from the Holy Script unless you, God, anoint me. The souls in this building did not come to hear me. It is your voice that we desperately seek. So I cast my crown at your feet. You're the King of Kings. I pray, God, that in this moment you would pastor us, shepherd us in this valley of the shadow of death. In Jesus' name, amen. Hug the person next to you. Let them know you love them. As you're grabbing your seats, I'm going to ask if you need a Bible, please raise your hand. We're going to jump into the scriptures. We're going to get, we're going to get going. I don't want to keep you long today. If you have your tablets or your phones or your Bibles, turn to Ephesians 2, verse 11. Ephesians 2, verse 11. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand. And we will have the ushers come to you with the Bible. Keep your hand raised until you receive said Bible. Amen. Also, please return those so that we can have them available next week. Amen. Hallelujah. Nothing wrong with one in the Word. Just one it the right way. Amen. Ephesians 2, verse 11. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version on your Bible apps. Thank God for the Bible app. Something short has nothing to do with the sermon, but if you have an iPhone, it'll tell you which apps you use the most. Um, what I would challenge you to do is if you are somebody who trusts in the Bible app, I would challenge you to rise in the rankings of that app being used the most. Um, that uh, if you want to get a good, sober view of how valuable the phone is to your spirit, look at the apps that you have and which ones feed your spirit or distract you from God's presence. Amen? Let's go to Ephesians 2.11. I'm moving quickly, man. This is great. I'm excited about God. Yes, sir. Wow, man. I'm excited about God. I'm excited about President Harrison being here. Um, um, and the reason why is because uh, I, I did not like CSUN when I first went, and I fell in love my freshman year. Uh, with the campus, and uh, I've always felt like we have a purpose there. And if you've ever been on campus at CSUN, it, 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 there's no greater place to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ than on that campus. It's, it's amazing. It's a commuter school full of people from different walks of life. And this church has been called to not only shepherd the people, but share God's love. And so when I see the president come in, it's just a confirmation and affirmation that God is still with this church on that campus. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's start. Let's get into it. Let's go. Ephesians 2, verse 11. We're going to read 11 through 18 if you want to highlight that. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Verse 15, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, 
thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. If I were to tag to the text today a sermon title, it would be Sacrifice for One, the Fight for Unity. Sacrifice for One, the Fight for Unity. I want to show a picture. A person here has talked about commencement. If you've uh, ever had the opportunity to walk across that stage, my God, it's an amazing, amazing thing. You, you, feel, like, uh, you feel like you've been freed from the Egypt that is Sally Mae for just that one moment because... Because, because you, because I don't know, man, it, there's something about going through this long process. And they tell you it's four years when you get in there, and, and quickly you realize that there's no possible way that you're going to finish that in four years based upon your freshman etiquette of studying. You know that. Uh, up front, you know that. You know that when you walk up on that stage, it came with a lot of turmoil, it came with a lot of cramming, it came with a lot of grades, because some of them professors gave us grades we know. Oh, wow, look at this. Everybody's holy today. Well, I know I had some... I had, I had some professors that gave me grace. I, when I say grace, I mean let me take some finals when I, I knew I had missed it on purpose. Did anybody else do that? Nobody else? I was, I was sick, and they asked for a doctor's note, and you come up with some weird excuse about, about how your car caught fire. And... Go ahead and show the picture of the commencement. In this picture... Amen. Y'all celebrate. Y'all know somebody up there? Probably not. In this picture, you're seeing a reaction that is extremely satisfying to the sight and to the soul. You're seeing a reaction of joy. And for some reason, when everybody's dressed in that cap and gown, there's this look of unity. You can look at that picture and almost imagine that some of those people were groups of friends that, that walked through some classes together, did some study groups together that there were some shared tears and some shared fears about upcoming exams or failed assignments, that there was some encouragement and some coffee breaks along the way, that you look at those pictures and you try to put together people to understand what their story might have been to come to this moment. In fact, this is just a small microcosm of a picture there because the actual graduation commencement ceremonies are huge. There's hundreds of graduates that come together. But the truth of the matter is, as somebody who's walked across that stage, I can tell you that for many of the cap and gown students in this picture, or even for myself, you're meeting people for the first time. That many of the people you have not never taken a class with. That many of these people were just students like you were on this vast campus. Some went to night school, some went to day school. Some took subjects that were scary and hard, like biology and engineering. And some of us took a whole lot of liberal studies classes that Help us get past with a grade, but we have no idea what we were learning. <laughs> but the truth is that out of all the years that you go to college, there's one day where you can come together and be unified. And the reason why this reaction of unification comes together is not because simply they're walking across the stage, but there is this celebration that we've made it. And the good news on that day is, is that if you walk across that stage, it's a symbol. It is a sign that you have finally conquered the thing that was plaguing you for so long. That what unifies people ultimately is good news. <laughs> that if you're ever looking for a reason for people to come together, good news will ultimately bring people together. That as a Raider fan... I've never heard that many claps ever in my life <laughs> for the Oakland Raiders. And as a current Laker fan, <laughs> praise God, I thought we had disappeared. It's funny, because the year that I graduated from high school in the year 2000, my Oakland Raiders went to the Super Bowl. And it was a great day for me but the strange part was, is that when it was time to watch the Super Bowl, all of us got together, all of my high school friends, and they started bringing friends. And it was weird that out of, out of nowhere, all of these Oakland Raider fans began to appear. That 
Throughout the season, I never heard them talking about the games. I never heard them quoting stats from their favorite players. In fact, I saw them wearing jerseys that, that didn't look like an Oakland Raiders jersey. But for some reason, when they played the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in that year, it was like all of a sudden they chose size, and it was like this grandiose moment because people knew that for the Raiders to get to the Super Bowl had to be an act of God. But the good news of the underdog who lost their coach to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers was a great thing. And so people began to put on jerseys simply because of the celebration of the good news of that story. And so it has been in the church that for most of our lives, we were not wearing the jersey of Christianity. Most of us felt unqualified to be called Christians, that we can look back in our past and in our lives and find various moments where if we would have had that jersey on, we probably would have been beat up in the stands for faking the funk on a nasty dunk, <laughs> as our pastor would say. That the true essence of who we were was the exact opposite of a fan of God. That the Bible calls us enemies of the cross. For some reason, it would be like waking up that morning and not just finding out that you're a fan, but waking up from a, general, from a call from the general manager saying, not only are you a fan, but you're on the team. That you get to reap all the benefits without having to play in the game. It was amazing when we got saved. Like, God pulled us out of darkness and called us onto his team, not just to be an outsider, but to be on the inside. And the fact that we were able to stand here in this church knowing that our past should disqualify us at the door, but that we can come into his presence boldly. That was good news to us. And we didn't know how to pay tithes. We didn't know any of the worship songs. Some of you guys didn't know them today. But it didn't stop you from being here because you were a fan. You couldn't quote stats on the miracles of Jesus. You couldn't name the Ten Commandments nor the Twelve Apostles, but you did know one thing, that Jesus loves you. This I know. And the foundation of our faith was not so much built on how much work we had done for Christ, but how much work Christ did for us. Us. And we were presented with this weird paradox that we could not understand, that, that, that we had more sins than we would care to admit, but that God loved us more than we could comprehend. Crazy paradox. That we were given this idea of Jesus Christ coming to the cross for the joy that was set before him, that Jesus Christ sees us as is, accepts us as is, loves us as is, saves us as is, but by his grace and his mercy, he won't leave us as is. That, that the revelation that Jesus didn't accept me because I'm perfect, but that he saw all the flaws and still found me beautiful. That was the good news for us. And in this scripture, this is what Paul is talking about when he brings to remembrance that, that, that Jesus died so he could break this, this barrier, this divide between us and God, that we can come before his presence, not because of rules or regulations of being a high priest, but that there was a high priest before us that gave us access despite our flaws. That, that's a great thing when you really think about it. If you really want to make sure that you have a good week, if you really want to make sure that you have something to celebrate even when a paycheck doesn't come, just remind yourself that you have been saved by grace. And let me tell you something, church. Let me tell you something. The potency of your relationship with God has to be held to the fact that you do not deserve to have a relationship with God, but yet and still, we still do. That is a great thing. That's like getting a paycheck and never going to work. My God. But the truth is, as the church, we don't get it. Myself, maybe you, we wake up some mornings and the love of Christ doesn't really satisfy us the way it used to. That even though we think about it and we talk about it and we know that it's supposed to, our fuel runs low and we need a little something extra. That our relationship somehow becomes stagnant. I know some married people have never experienced that, but there are some times you've been around somebody for so long that you start to look at them and don't feel the way you did on that first date. Now, for me, I'm still in the newlywed stage, so I wake up in the morning and still question why my wife is still there and say, thank you, God, for her still being here with me. But there's this weird divide. 
There's this weird divide between those who come into the church as fresh new believers and are excited and zealous, and you guys know those people. We like to call them the, t- the teacher's pets of Christianity. They're willing to serve God on a level that you know. They just make you look bad. You ever see those people? Every time, it's like it's midweek, it's prayer, they're at both services, they're serving the pastor throughout the week, and you're thinking to yourself, where do you have the time to do all of that? But you remember a time when you were like that. There's a time where you used to get up in the morning excited to actually pray. And you would walk through your bathroom or in your shower, speaking in tongues and tearing the tile off of the shower shower walls, praying heaven down, and the dove would descend upon your body, and you would hear God say, this is my beloved son or daughter, who I'm well pleased. It was a great experience. You were watching TBN for no reason. You would see TBN, and you would get a word from the commercials. The infomercials would give you a word, and you would begin to call your friends and text your friends and be like, God just shared a word with me. You need to get this anointed prayer handkerchief. But see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. (laughs) Here's the thing, as time progresses, we lose that excitement, and then we turn back and look at those who come in, and we almost, we almost find ourselves looking weirdly at those who are coming in. It's, it's, um, it's one of those things where you ask yourself, uh, uh, how did they get saved? I remember when I was in junior high, I fought this guy named Michael Johnson. He was the bully of the school, and on the last day of school, he uh, slapped the books out of my hand, and so I slapped him across his face. I was attempting to slap every piece of intelligence out of his brain, (laughs) because I had a lot of books. And, uh, and on the last day of school, you, you tend not to care because what they're going to do, suspend you? I'm out, right? I quickly realized why Michael Johnson was a bully, and he had a lot of practice at, um, he had a lot of practice at fighting. Uh, and I was, I was, uh, I was, I was, uh, I was not, uh, but we went toes. It was good. About six years later, I'm in Redlands at this thing they call Market Night. They have it down here in Northridge on Wednesdays. It was a Friday night. All the people went down there, and I'm down there with my friends. This is six years later. I'm getting ready to get out of high school. And at this point, I see Michael Johnson coming down the street. Hadn't seen him in six years. All I can remember was me slapping him and us squatting. So I'm sitting next to my boy. I say, hey, man. Um, um, so... So look, okay, in about 40 feet, something may happen if anything happens to me. Look me in my eyes, look me in my, if anything happens to me, you got my back, right? Because I don't think I can do it again. And so I told him, I said, yo, I said, this dude I fought back in middle school is coming down the way. And he came down and we were bracing ourselves up. You know, you guys know that, you guys know that walk when you, you know what I mean? Put your foot in the tee real quick. Just. So me and Zeke and Jamal, y'all know DJ Malski. He was with me. We were all, and I'm the youngest. I'm the shortest. I'm like, yeah, man, this is, this is going to be on. And in Michael's entourage were four kids. And he sees me from afar, and he goes, Yo! And I say, okay, now you, okay, come on, hold me up, hold me up. He goes, man, it's good to see you. I said, hold on, it's, it's a trick, hold on. Go back. Come to find out, Michael had gotten saved the year after we fought. Got married directly out of high school, had four kids and was a pastor. <laughs> And he's sharing this news with me, and he's going in, and my boys are confused because the story I told them does not match the description of what they're seeing. And I'm going, no. Nope. He goes, what are you doing? I said, well, you know, um, I go to church. You know, I, um, um, I, uh, I got the new Kirk Franklin album. I, um, man, uh, we're here evangelizing. We just out here, we just praying for folk, and we just... We weren't praying for nobody. And so um, it, was, it was weird because without words, there was a wall of hostility that had been built based upon previous experiences. And um, it's weird because I love Black History Month, man. I love my black people. I love y'all. 
But there are sometimes a tendency to go so far that our past dictates how we treat those around us. And Dr. Martin Luther King was a great guy, wasn't he? Uh, if anybody saw the movie Selma, it was, it was, it was amazing to, to see that movie, to see all the work that he had done. Anybody see Selma? Yeah. And it was, it was amazing because we saw pieces of Dr. Martin Luther King that we didn't know. And it caused me to go out and get this book called Letter from a Birmingham Jail. And began to read this story about Dr. Martin Luther King on April 12th in 1963. He was going around to various areas that were hot with racism, trying to find ways to not just bring equality for his people, but to bring unity amongst the masses. He had this plan in his heart that he was going to unify the nation, that one man with one mission was going to gather the hearts of many. And he decides to pick this place called Birmingham. And in this time of Birmingham, there had been so many bombings in a six-month period that it was nicknamed Bombingham, Alabama. It was a horrible time, and so he decides on April 12th to go down to Birmingham to form a union of people to get together and protest and to do this thing nonviolently and to make a stance. And within days, he finds himself in jail. And while he was in jail, they denied him access to his lawyers, but he was able to get a message to his wife, who was then able to call uh, President Kennedy, and they were able to share some words. And when it was time for him to be bailed out, Dr. Martin Luther King chose to stay longer. For the longer that he was in jail, the more exposure would come to the area of the injustice that was happening. Really strange tactic. But while he was in the jail, he decides to get a pen and some paper and begins to write this letter. And when you hear the idea of the letter from a Birmingham jail, you're wondering what would Dr. Martin Luther King write? What would cause him to stay in captivity for that much time to write out a letter? And I thought he was writing against the politicians in that area that were obviously oppressing the people. Or maybe he was writing to his own people, encouraging them to keep going despite the absence of his leadership. But the actual pen was to the church. And eight leaders of Caucasian descent in the area. And his, his pen was not writing to the violent voices around him, but to the silent majority that were supposed to be supporting him that in that very area were those who called themselves Christians, that were parishioners, that were men of the cloth, that had given their lives to spreading the gospel, but yet were sitting silent during injustice. And his pen was writing to these white leaders, asking them not just to do something, but to say something. And it was a great moment. It's a great letter. If you ever have a chance to read it, you can go online. There's a free PDF version of it. But to listen to the things that he was saying or read the things that he was saying inside the church, it was amazing. But it wasn't the first time that we've seen this. That as Paul is writing this letter to the church of Ephesus, he too was in jail. That Paul had been in prison for going through trying to reconcile and causing great disturbances amongst those who were against unity. They have placed him inside the jail. His pen, however, did not go towards those who were hostile towards him, but instead he wrote to the church that Philippians and Galatians and Ephesians and Corinthians, all of these letters came from Paul's pen as he was imprisoned, trying to spread a message to those. So when you hear things like, love your enemy, it came with a different context because he was in jail because of the enemies, causing uh, him to write a letter to those on the outside to love those that put him in jail. That's a, that's a weird place to be. Kind of like Dr. Martin Luther King uh, writing to the black uh, people saying, hey, listen, don't be violent, just be silent and love on them anyway. That's a hard thing to grasp, especially in today's social climate, because in today's social climate, it don't work like that. It's hard to love. It's one thing to look at somebody and have an argument. It's another thing when you watch your own people be shot. And then hear, love your enemy. See, the hard part about Christianity is not getting saved. It's, it's doing the love part that Christ did. And that the same power of love that we just talked about in the beginning and celebrating that God loved us, how weird is it that God would also love the terrorists? That the true power is not loving us who just had an issue with disobeying our parents, but loving those who are so twisted in their mind that they would take the lives of children. That's the power of the gospel. That is the true good news, is that he can turn an enemy of the cross into a friend of the cross. And listen, listen. (laughs) 
Paul was the perfect person to write this letter. For Paul was a strange person. Paul was born of the tribe of of Benjamin. He was a Jew, but he was also adopted into the Pharisees, that he also had this great understanding of the Torah and the law, but also understood how Pharisees operated. He, 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 He understood how Christians operated so much that he was able to infiltrate their system and kill them. That Paul was a part of this weird system that was in Rome at that time that were not just persecuting Christians, they would take their bodies and put them on stakes and set them on fire and use them as torches in the city that the streetlights were burning Christians. And Paul was the one who did it. Everybody knew Paul. Paul was the suge knight of his day. (laughs) And look at what Jesus does. Jesus walks three years with his disciples. He dies, he gets buried, he resurrects, and then he walks the earth for 40 days, and right before he leaves, he leaves them in charge of, of, of doing this great work. Do what I do. Go ahead. And the sins. And it's at this point that he calls Paul later on, after Jesus has left the disciples, he calls Paul now to pastor the church. Think about that. The disciples now are left to carry out Christ's commandments, but Christ ain't there. And that in these moments, they would normally watch Christ be the example, and then they would follow suit, but they couldn't even watch Christ do it. That they were responsible for loving on the very person that was killing their people. That Paul was an assassin, and now was called to be a pastor. What would we do if a Saddam Hussein was saved and called to pastor your church? What would you do if an Osama bin Laden came to pastor your church. A Jim Crow came to pastor your church. The silence that you feel now (laughs) is the silence that Paul felt. But let's flip the script. Let's just say that it's you now who are hated by the others and that you had an experience with Jesus Christ and you're the only one now who had this experience and you're coming before the church to tell them, I had an experience with Jesus. And they said, no way, Paul, where were you when he turned water into wine? Paul, where were you when he was raising people from the dead? He was turning fishes and loaves and feeding masses. Where were you, Paul? He goes, I was killing y'all. That's what I was doing. But while you guys were hiding in a room, I had an experience on a horse and I know it was Jesus. And he's calling me now to join you. And Paul was in an interesting position because the apostles never truly accepted him. And the Pharisees thought he was crazy for joining the church, and he was a lone man. Writing about reconciling two groups. That these two groups he was talking about reconciling were were vastly different groups. Understand what was happening. Paul would come into the town, and he would ask two questions. Number one, he would ask, where is the synagogue? Show me where the Jews are. And he would walk into the synagogue and begin to parse the scriptures with them and begin to talk and teach. And then he would go, where are the Gentiles? Where's the marketplace? And he would find them in the hall of Tyrannus. And he would be speaking to those who were Romans, who served multiple gods and hated Christians. And he would find a way to pen in his paper there and be able to speak and talk and be able to shift their hearts now to love Jesus as opposed to killing those who do. And now he has a problem. He has two different people who, who ultimately hate each other, a group on the north side who were considered the Gentiles and a group on the south side who were considered the Jews. And both of them hated each other. And he had to find a way to put them together. Now, he could have just started a church on the north side and said, hey, here's going to be the Gentile church. And on the south side, this will be the Jew church. And you guys can separate and, have, and worship Jesus on your own terms. Do church the way you like. Instead, he says Jesus died so that wall of hostility can be broken down and that the true measure of Christ's salvation power on the inside of you is not the idea that you can just serve him, but that you can serve him amongst other enemies that the unifying factor between the Jews and the Gentiles is that they were both considered enemies of the cross and God called them together to be called family amongst one, that we were all accepted into the beloved. In fact, you hear Paul write this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because the power of Jesus Christ and to our salvation, but he goes first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. That was hard scripture to understand, that it wasn't just the fact that he was unashamed of the gospel, but he was unashamed in front of the north side church and unashamed in front of the south side church and in the middle, all the people who couldn't make up their minds and calls them all together and says, Christ is the reason why you're together. That most of the churches that you see in this New Testament were multi-ethnic churches. The truth is, that's not today. 
In fact, in 1787, they had these things, these Methodist churches. They were all white Methodist churches. And this guy walks in and gets on his knees and begins to pray to God. And the parishioners became so upset with this black man inside of an all-white church. They pick him up in the middle of his prayers and kick him out. The African-American community was upset. So they decide, we're going to go rent this blacksmith hall and have church there. And there was the birth of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And it's something worth celebrating, but it's almost sad to your heart that that even had to happen. That the more churches that are formed and denominations that are formed, we look schizophrenic to the public. That the Christ that we talk about is unified, Father, Son, Spirit, so much as so, they're so one, we can't, we can't even explain their dynamic, but the church, we can explain that. That black people don't go to white churches because we like a little soul in our music. That white people don't go to black churches because we stay in church too long. But it would be one thing if it was just about black or white, but even inside the black church, the same thing happened. A hundred years later, after the AME church was formed, you see the Southern Baptist church, and there's this split about slavery, and now the Southern Baptist is split off. And then a few years later, you're seeing this, this, this man, this young black guy in the middle of a black Baptist church, and he begins to speak in tongues, and they don't like it. So he leaves the church and starts the Pentecostal church, and now you have another denomination inside of a denomination that should have never existed. And now we celebrate and make fun of and joke about the fact that Dr. Martin Luther King's statement was still true. That it's appalling that the most segregated hour in America is the 11 o'clock hour on a Sunday morning. That if you, want to, if you want to see the life, the bloodline of segregation, just look at the churches on Sunday. And as we close out black history, this is a hard message because we're celebrating blackness, but God is not calling you to be unified to turn down your blackness, but celebrate not only yours, but those around you. And that's hard. That's hard because when you've been oppressed, that's hard. But think about the Jewish people now. Okay? Okay? We at least now have the option of coming together. Right now. Okay? Okay? And people can come in here, but we got that covered. Amen. My people, my ushers, we got that covered. If somebody comes in here, we got it taken care of, people. And I mean, on a, we got it taken care of. <laughs> okay? We got you. But what happens when you have to have secret church that you can't announce or put out bulletins or put on Facebook where you're going to be because that's the very place that, that Paul and his people would show up to kill you. That to give your life over to Christ actually means that you are really giving over your life. That there were those who came down to get saved at the altar and their kids would be killed that night. But they had to make a decision in that moment. What would be an altar call if you knew that giving your life up here meant giving your life up in the natural? What kind of altar call moment would that be? That instead of us just saying, Jesus, come into my heart, we say, Jesus, I literally give you my life. And this is what the Jewish people were facing. And not only that, they were called to become now. Could you imagine this altar call? Imagine this altar call now. Paul goes into the hall of Tyrannus, and he begins to preach now to the Gentile, those who were persecuting the Jews. And could you imagine the first day of Jewish church in the synagogue? You see a bunch of Romans walk in and sit next to him and say, hey, how you doing? Could you imagine those standing at the door who were welcoming at the synagogue with bulletins, and they see the Gentiles coming, and now are wondering, do I run? Or do I accept them? And the love of God says, regardless of what they plan to do, love them anyway. Wow, what a statement from the gospel. The body is called to be unified. John says, how can I love God who I do not see and hate my brother who I do not see? And here's the part about Dr. Martin Luther King that we don't talk about. The later years of his life and ministry, he was not liked that after a while, this message from Malcolm X became more and more potent because the more that they sat silent and were being persecuted, the more they sat silent and were being killed, they wanted to retaliate, and there was a leader who came up who gave them the access to retaliate. So towards the end of his life, he was standing, preaching to congregations who didn't believe what he was saying. That's hard. I think I'm going to miss that. Okay. God is trying to create a new thing. Do this for me. Turn here. We're, we're still in Ephesians 2. I want to go to verse 14. 
And I want you to underline. I'm going to read, but I want you to underline when, when, I, when I tell you to underline. For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity. I want you to underline the word new. In the Bible, there really are two different connotations of the word new. New as it relates to time and new as it relates to kind. Let me give you an example. I love cars, man. I love them. I absolutely love them. And uh, what you'll find is that the most expensive car is not actually the latest model. You could have a brand new Benz, and that's not the most expensive car. But the most expensive cars are the ones that are the first of its kind, like the Tesla SUV, an all-electric SUV. We've never seen that before. And the, the price is in the $100,000 range, far beyond what we could imagine. And we all look at that and go, that is an amazing piece of technology. But the reason it costs so much is because it's never been seen. The value in the Tesla is not held in how new it is in accordance to time, but how new it is in accordance to kind. And that the value of the church has nothing to do with the newest model of church that we present. That we can come in here and we can, we can kind of update our model to, to be able to reach the new generation. Let's update ourselves and make ourselves more current. And every year there's a 2016 Hope's House and a 2014 Hope's House and a 2019 Hope's House. And every year seems to be a little bit different because we're tweaking and we're tweening. But really what Christ was trying to create was something that had never been seen before. A church full of people who were enemies coming together and loving beyond comprehension. A church that had never been seen. And what I want to tell you guys is in the midst of this social climate where everything is going wrong, and you could be Muslim, you could be black, Christian, you can find a group and you can find persecution on some sort of level. But in the midst of this weird social climate, what God is trying to get is not an updated version of the church. He's trying to get a brand new thing that in this climate, if we could find ourselves loving while the rest of the world is hating, if we can find ourselves accepting while the rest of the world is rejecting, if we can find ourselves bringing in those who were once enemies of the cross and enemies of our culture and enemies of our race, if we can bring all of that together, it has never been seen before. The jokes about the church would stop. Amen. Amen. That you would see Baptist and Pentecostal, Apostolic and AME, Seventh-day Adventist and black church coming together, and people will look at you and wonder, what happened to them? And the truth of the matter is, is that on one side, there's a me, and 40 feet away, there's a Michael Johnson. And that we can view Michael Johnson and the view of who he is, or we can allow the crowd to separate and get closer to find out that there's kids and generations attached to Michael Johnson. That that God has already done a work in them regardless of what you've seen on TV. And your last memory can't be the current memory because God is trying to do a new thing in your life. My last piece in these last six minutes that I have is to say this, that uh, everything that I said may be true, it may be great, and it may be the word, but the honest to God truth comes in verse 19. And I want you to join me in verse 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Let me explain to you how this works. We talked about the tabernacle, but ultimately we're going to move to this place called the temple. And the temple had divides inside of it, that there was this, uh, there was like this, this court of Gentiles, and then there was the court of women, and then there was the court of Israelites, and then there was the court of priests, that there was actually found not too long ago that they found the actual temple that had this inscription written on it, that the Gentile was to move no further in fear of death, that you can only celebrate in your corner. You can only celebrate in your court because if you moved further, you would die. Not because God would kill you, but because the people inside the church would. It's another thing for the church to kill you on common ground. Which looks worse to God? Enemies hating each other are those who are considered family in the same house killing each other. 
So when Paul references this wall of hostility, he says, now you guys are all unified in one household. Now there is no temple like that anymore. Now you guys have no barriers to separate you. Women can worship with men and Jews with Gentiles and priests now can now come in with the congregation that there's no respect of person in Jesus Christ, that now we're all together because we were all enemies and now we're all saved and we're all trying to get to heaven. Hopefully, hopefully our hearts will turn to what Paul is saying. Let's keep going. Verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, watch this, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. That if we really are trying to do something new, Hope's House, and do church like it's never been done before, this is the perfect climate to do it. And the only way you're going to do it is if Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. That our opinions and our emotions cannot trump our belief in God. And the hardest question I've ever asked our students at Bible study It's the hardest question that I asked even my own mother who wrote her dissertation for her doctorate degree on Africa and our birth from Africa coming into this nation, that she had me typing out this thing. And I learned more about Africa than I think any any kid could at the age of 13 on a word processor, not a computer. That means you can make a mistake and have to type the whole thing all over again. You don't use whiteout on dissertations. The hardest thing that I asked them and the question that I posed to them, and I said, here, here is the problem that we face for every race, but especially us as black people. Which do you choose to be first and primary in your life? I'm telling you guys, listen, you're going to crucify me possibly with your eyes, and I get it. But are you black before you're Christian or Christian before you're black? And I'm, listen, listen, and listen, half of us are celebrating and half of us are waiting to meet me in the parking lot. It's cool. I parked back here. I question it for myself. I have a son who's happy and jumping in church, but at some day he's going to meet up with somebody who doesn't like the color of his skin. And I'm going to have to teach him to be proud of who he is as a black person, but proud of who he is in Christ. And that one, listen, and that who he is in Christ will always ultimately shed what's happening on the skin because this is going to fade away. And what God is going to judge, listen, is not the corruptible, but the incorruptible, that we will all be joined together with new body, new heaven, new earth, new church, that we will all come together in the great temple. And serve God. Um, You you guys can come on up uh, with my last two minutes. I'm asking us to stand for a moment as we get ready to pray. I don't want to pretend as though what we heard today is easy to accept. I'd be a horrible pastor if I was asking you to do something and totally disregarding what happened in our history. Some of us, even we were talking about it in a minister's meeting, some of our own ministers were recipients of the racism. I was born in the 80s. I hear about stories, but nothing that I've experienced in my lifetime will ever match up with Uncle Kelvin and Uncle Skeeter and Jim Pickens and Aunt Pam and Pamela Mudd. I, I, I don't know what that's like. I wasn't there for that. So for me to ask all of those people who are a, a recipient of that, for me to ask a mother who watched their son get killed by the cops, for me to ask that of them is hard. But I can't deny the truth of the gospel. My prayer today is that God will give us all strength to do it because even though I haven't experienced it yet at some level, I'm going to have to experience it. The greatest story that I heard was uh, the Amish. The Amish. There was a place, a church in the Amish country. They had a church and a school. They were all in the same land. And, uh, this kid got disgruntled. And uh, he... Uh, He came onto the grounds, and um, he walked into the church where they were having Sunday school with children. And he shot all of them and killed them, and and then killed himself. It was the strangest thing 
the news goes to cover it, and they're talking to one of the leaders of the Hamish community. They come to ask him a question that was predicated on an action that he had done that didn't get covered in the news, that the Amish people came together and went and found the family of the kid who killed their children and asked them, what can we do to help? Because your son is dead. So the reporter comes and says, what would cause you to come all the way outside of your Amish community to find the mother of the boy who killed all of your children. What, what caused you to do that? He goes, we're Christians. It's what we do. And I couldn't understand that because if somebody came into my son's daycare and shot my son, I don't know if I would have it in me, but Christ did not ask me to have that in me. He asked for him to be in me. And every day I challenge myself. With what does it look like to give glory to God on a level that I couldn't understand? That I can preach to you guys because you guys accept me. What do I do when the day comes where I preach to those who hate me and want to kill my children? What happens then? What happens to the altar call then? How do I lay hands and pray for those people? Because they're out there. And we've seen them. So right now I want us to join hands. In our prayer right now, before we get to the salvation and before we get to the Holy Spirit and joining the church and baptism and all of that stuff, I want us to pray that God would give us the strength, that God would come not only into our hearts, but into our emotions, into everything that we have and help us to be who he's called us to be because we're called to love at that level, whether we're comfortable with it or not. In fact, Jesus said, before I leave, if I don't leave, that the comforter cannot come, which means that we were already destined for uncomfortable moments. And it's not for us to try to make the uncomfortable moments comfortable for us by separating and getting around our black friends or getting around our white friends, but Instead, asking the Holy Spirit to dwell on the inside and cause us to be the bridge, cross, gap, bear for those around us. Let's pray. Let's pray. Come on. Let's pray. Let's pray. Ask God to help you. Ask God to help you. Ask God to help us. Ask God to help us. We need it. We need it because it's real, man. Violence is real. Come on. We need it. We need it. We need it. Hallelujah. 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 We're called to greatness, guys, but greatness comes at a cost. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Being called by Christ means that we forfeit the right to be the exception. That we can't hold the same excuses that the world does, as valid as they may be. God, we thank you for being the model that you gave your son up to die for your enemies. That you sent your son knowing that we would spit on him. And that we would rip the flesh off his back and crown him with thorns and nail him to a cross. You, you knew we would do that. And you knew that you were going to allow that to happen. You knew that. And you sent him anyway knowing how wicked we are in our hearts. You did it. And the truth is, God, we can't say that we would do the same. God, help us. Help us to love at that level. Help us to sacrifice for one new humanity. I pray, God, for those of us who are scarred by real life experiences. That God is not just something that we came up with in our imagination or watched on the news. We were the news that never got reported. I pray for that person, God, who is dealing with the pain of their past. Help us, God, to use that pain to fuel our love for the future generation. That the kids in the street who are learning violence through our generation, God, I pray that you would turn the tide, flip the script, and cause them now to learn how to love at a level that no other generation has ever seen, God, because they're watching us model it. In Jesus' name, I pray, God, that you would forgive us, every race. Forgive us, God for our comfortability in our own skin, so much as so that we separate ourselves from those that you've called us to minister to. Allow us to be free to minister to the very Pauls that are persecuting our own people. This next call, is if you don't know Jesus, and listen, I know we have altar calls and I know it's about coming out of darkness and coming out of sin, but Jesus did not save you for your own freedom, but that we would become slaves to righteousness for his purpose. 
that what you're signing up for now, what you're signing up for is not just a simple coming to church or coming to Bible study, but that you're going to have some real life hardships and called to do some pretty weird things in your workplace, at your school, in your family, forgiving people like your father who you swore you would never forgive. But you can't do it on your own. What separates us from any other religion is that we don't rely on our good morals. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. We rely upon Jesus Christ to live on the inside of us. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our King. And when he asks us to do things, we may not be in agreement, but we'll do it. If you want to sign up for that, if you want to give your life over to Jesus so that he can give you the power to do that, and you know that the same call that Dr. Martin Luther King was talking about in 1963, April 12th through the 14th, if that's the same thing you want to be a part of, now is the time to come to the front. If you want to give your life over to Jesus Christ, Join me at the front. Counselors, please come. Truth is, that call will stay open. That call will stay open. I'm telling you, that call will stay open, young and old alike. Here's the next call, and you may need prayer for this. You know God has called you to love, but on some level, whether it be racially motivated, whether it be family motivated, maybe your dad or your family member did something to you, like, like molest you or rape you, and in the back of your mind, you're having a problem with forgiving that person. And you know that if God asks you to do anything, as long as he doesn't ask you to forgive that person, you're good. But you know that's not the way. Jesus says, if you don't forgive, I will not forgive you. You know, you can't do it on your own, but you want to be able to say on that great day, God, thank you for helping me. You want God to help you with forgiving. I want you to come meet these, these ministers here at the front. Don't even think about it. Just come down. Your soul depends on this. Your soul depends on this. Your soul depends on this. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Maybe there's somebody who did something to somebody in your family, and you're struggling with that took the life of one of your family members and you're struggling with that, if that is you, come down. I'm telling you, God is here to help you. God is here to help you. He is not asking you to do it in your own strength. You will fail every time. One of the things that God gives us to help us do that is his Holy Spirit. That being filled with the Spirit is much more than speaking in tongues around people that you like. It's much, it's much more than walking through your halls, your halls at work and putting oil on the walls or putting oil over your children. It's much more than that. that. There's this thing that they talk about called fruit. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. And it comes with like long-suffering and patience and love. And you want to birth those fruits in your life. The thing about fruit is they're birthed for other people to eat. That you want to be filled with the Spirit so that the people around you can get what they need from God and that he would be the work inside of you. If that's you and you want to be filled with the Spirit or know more about that, come meet our counselors down here at the front. And lastly, the local church was created to be the brand new thing in the community. That multiple churches isn't the issue. It's the ultimate, it's the, it's the multiple churches that are fine-tuned to make people feel better about what they want as opposed to what Christ is looking for. Here at Hope's House, we're endeavoring to become the Christ-like church. And you want to join this endeavor for us not only to be multi-ethnic, but a brand new thing. You want to be the new Tesla on the street. You want to join this church. Shemot is over here to my right. You can meet with him now or even after church and say, you know what? I'm down for the cause. I want to join this church. Amen. While ministry is going forth, let's pray one more time and then turn it over to Pastor Chuck. God, thank you for today. I pray that you would seal once again for us to be doers of your word, not just hearers. We thank you, God, for putting us on this brand new mission to be a brand new church as brand new people in the same old generation, that you're doing a brand new thing in the hearts of not only us, 
but churches across this nation, God, that you are unifying us to a global mission. I thank you, God, that you're giving us the strength to do so. I pray, God, that you would cover us with your blood as we attempt to love you on a grander level. We give you honor and glory and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 How many folks can say amen to that message today? Amen. 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 I believe this church has lots of potential, as I believe every church has lots of potential. But because we put God in a box, so oftentimes we prohibit him from expanding us to be the church he's called us to be. And we all come to church with our own minds of what church is supposed to be like. Folks are supposed to love me. It's supposed to be a good environment, worship, praise, good word. But God has called us not just to have a good church experience, but to be the church wherever we have experiences with people who don't look like us. Amen? And so the message is timely. We live in a time where we are so polarized, whether it's political issues, gender issues, workforce issues, labor union issues, social media issues, prep food. We have so much polarization in our society, political issues. The one place we should be able to find unity is in the church. We should, but we still have issues. I want to encourage you to pray. Pray and ask God to speak to your heart all week about this message. Because this is central to the walk with God that we're called to walk. I love it how he said he had this beef with a guy from his past. And God broke down the middle wall of partition because the guy was changed. And it opened the door up for him to have fellowship and relationship. And God wants to use you the same way. Some people look at you as the old you. But you got to say, I've been changed. And bring the good news that lets them know it's okay to love me. It's okay to relate to me. It's okay to talk to me. It's okay to have fellowship because I'm a new person. That's my prayer for this church. My prayer for us. Amen. You can have your seats right now. We're going to move into a time where we worship God. Worship God with our giving. Amen. Amen. Let's come on. Give God. Let's thank God in advance for what he's already done for us. So we're going to ask you if you're here today. We definitely need folks to help this church be the church. I want this church to be a force, not just in this community, beyond the borders of CSUN, beyond the borders of Granada Hills, but in this state, in this nation. I think we can make an influence on the nation. That's just me. Got a couple of amens, okay. Me and Mark, we're gonna change the nation, okay. But listen, God, had, I, I was gonna do a message called, How Big Is Your Church? Most folks' churches are very, very small. It's just the four walls, but the church is called to extend beyond the walls of the buildings and touch lives in various areas and various locations. And we are that church, whether you know it or not. So we're going to ask you to give today and ask you to seek the Lord about what to give, what to give, how much to give. Lord, how can I be a blessing so this church can be a blessing to those who I would never meet? Amen. Those who don't look like me, who don't think like me, who don't act like me, 
who may not even like me, how can I bless them? Amen. So as you're making out your offering envelopes, we have several ways that you can give. We have online giving through the Host House app. You can give online. You can give through the kiosk outside. You can give the old-fashioned way. You can drop a million dollars in the bucket if you want to. Y'all missed that. You can give the old-fashioned way. You can write a check to HHCM or Hope's House. But by all means, let's honor God by our giving. By all means, let's honor God by our giving. By all means, let's honor God by our giving. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me. If you're ready to give, just stand to your feet. We're going to pray together. Amen. And once again, we appreciate all those who are giving through bill pay and have made a regular commitment to give. And it's just taking out your check. We appreciate that. Uh, those who are learning how to give, start somewhere. The worst thing you can say is, I can't give anything. Because you can't give something. Because you go to Starbucks, you go to McDonald's, you go to the clubs. You go, oh, I'm sorry. This, this is church. I'm sorry. There's a, co there's a cover charge to go to a club, isn't it? Hallelujah. I, I'm going I'm to I'm I'm stop right there. Okay. Everywhere you go, someone's asking you to give something. I think God, who's done so much for us, deserves just a little. Just, amen. Amen. Raise your offering with me. We're going to pray. Father, we thank and praise you that you have given us such amazing gifts and such amazing privileges as believers that we never had before. We didn't deserve salvation. We certainly don't deserve grace. And we certainly don't deserve mercy. But yet you gave it to us anyway. And you chose us before the foundation of the world to be on your side while we were yet enemies of the cross. For that long, we can praise you. But you've done more than that. You bless us with new mercies every day. You provided for us. We are clothed. We're in our right minds. We have jobs we can go to. We have cars we can drive because you've given to us so lavishly. So right now we ask as we give, Lord God, that it will be a, res re a response to your love for us, a response to your goodness toward us, that the God of all grace and mercy has given us great and precious gifts that we might be partakers of his divine nature. We respond to that love by saying, Lord, thank you, and we give so this word, this good news, can break down barriers. God, we thank you and praise you as we give. Your word says it will be given back to good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into a bosom. So we thank you in advance for opportunities, for open doors, for jobs, for promotions, for increase, Lord God, for receiving money from diverse places. We thank you for the amazing ways you give back to us. In Jesus' name, we consecrate this offering by faith. In Jesus' name, we say amen. If you are on my right, go that way to that wall. The usher will serve you here. Center section and to my left. Go that way. We'll serve you. Let's rejoice as we give. I know all things work together. Amen. Oh, my. 
intentional for you amen listen i know god has great plans for your life he has great plans for today and your tomorrow and as we walk in god's word you'll see them unfold before your very eyes i promise you because god is intentional amen we are standing our feet we're going to dismiss in the absence of my lovely wife right here pastor dre by faith we want to thank you for coming and celebrating Black History Month with us, amen. Wonderful job by all the presentations. The Hope Steppers and the uh, Stepettes, Hopeettes, will, will be touring in a city near you soon, one day. We want to give a special thanks and shout out to pa pa Pastor, ooh, I called you Pastor. And you, you never know. Listen, I went to Cal State Norwich for engineering. I became a pastor, so it can happen. <laughs> Dr. Harrison and her husband John, we bless you. Thank you. It's always an absolute pleasure. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What's our simple message? Hi, I'm Pastor Charles Humphrey, Senior Pastor of Hope's House Christian Ministries. And I'm Andrea Humphrey, Co-Pastor of Hope's House Christian Ministries. So we would like to thank you, first of all, for taking time to view our service. Now, if you are ever in the LA area visiting or if you actually live locally, We'd love to invite you to come out to see what happens here at Hope's House, live and in person. Our services are every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. We have a saying around here, whose house, Hope's house. And we'd like to say, whose house, your house. So, as my husband said, if you're ever in the area, come and join us. Now, if you have any prayer requests, or if you just want more information about this particular ministry, uh, you can write us by using an email address also, if you'd like to be a supporter of Hope's House, you can do so by using any of the giving options that you see on your screen at this time. So again, we want to thank you for watching. We believe this is an amazing ministry of God doing really powerful things in the community, transforming lives. So join us every Sunday morning, live streaming here at Hope's House Christian Ministries. Thank you for watching. God bless.